I think um, some folks will be exposed to the the term ApoB, mm-hmm. and it seems like the conversation is starting to shift a little bit from LDL cholesterol to ApoB being potentially, at least in, in certain circumstances, a better predictor of cardiovascular disease or marker of kind of risk of atherosclerosis. Where does ApoB come into this conversation with regards to these different types of lipoproteins and, and why is it important and this probably starts to take us down the the, the path of the pathology and what's going wrong yeah yeah, go. yeah so uh, this is kind of something that has refined our understanding over time and so the best way to think of this is as i just noted for something like an ldl cholesterol or an ldlc that someone might get measured that is measuring the cholesterol content of that lipoprotein but we can also care about how many of these lipoproteins we have? What is the number of particles? And so one way to try and assess the number of not only LDL, but other lipoproteins, apart from HDL, importantly, which I'll come back to, is by measuring this apolipoprotein B, or as we call it, ApoB, uh, that sits on these lipoproteins. Now, importantly, this doesn't sit on the HDL particle but it will be on the LDL, IDLs, VLDLs, these other lipoproteins that we consider to be more atherogenic than HDL. Mm-hmm. And some of that relates to the density of that lipoprotein and therefore its size, mm-hmm. um, and also this forward and reverse transport. But so we have a way to measure the number of those atherogenic lipoproteins, LDLs, IDLs, VLDLs, et cetera, that all contain, that have this ApoB sitting on them. So there's one of these ApoBs on each of those particles. So by measuring ApoB, it's giving us a good idea of the number of these different particles. And that refinement in understanding risk over time has essentially highlighted that it's not necessarily the, the cholesterol content per se of those particles, but the uh, that is an important part, but the overall number of those particles, if we have much more ApoB containing lipoproteins, that elevates risk. Uh, there's, a, there's a concept of concordance and discordance, which we're going to explore more, uh, where in certain cases, if they're concordant, that means that pretty much the, an increased amount of ApoB or number of LDL containing particles, let's say, would be concordant or rise linearly with the increase in LDL cholesterol. In some cases, it can be discordant, which is where one may be a better predictor than the other. So is that because in, in those, those circumstances, you have greater numbers of like VLDLs and IDLs, which also contain the ApoB um, and, and less LDL? So th- there's, it's interesting that there's a kind of, a, as, I, as I understand that kind of heterogeneity here in mm. terms of that distribution, where you can have either an underestimation or overestimation mm-hmm. of risk. So let's say you take someone that has an LDL cholesterol that would be in a normal range that we would indicate is at low risk. But for whatever reason, their ApoB or even their LDL particle count is really high. So that would put them in the high risk count. In in a situation like that, that person could be at higher risk than indicated by their LDL Mm -hmm. cholesterol result. Mm -hmm. But you also have, it seems on a distribution, people at the opposite end that the LDL cholesterol might be... uh, look a bit higher relative to they actually have a, maybe a lower ApoB uh, count or a lower LDL mm-hmm. particle count. Mm-hmm. And therefore, that might, their LDL cholesterol number may over... Uh, Is that because they have, they, they have kind of more large, fluffy LDL particles that are carrying more cholesterol, but there's less of them? Is that, is that how you'd end up in that position? So it'd be uh, essentially, as I understand it, the... Uh, as Alan said, this protein and cholesterol content that we have generally for these different classes of lipoproteins. But of course, there's some variation. There's some kind of range within them of, of how much each of those particles may have. So if you, in a certain individual, have a greater cholesterol content per lipoprotein for that situation, uh, that would lend itself right. to... Uh, mm-hmm. okay. So bottom line, though, the the, the best predictor... Or, and, and the best way of kind of avoiding misinterpretation, if you're interpretation, if you're just looking at LDL, is to go directly to the number of particles and measure ApoB. Yeah, I think mm-hmm. ApoB is probably the strongest uh, indicator relative to certainly an LDL cholesterol uh, number. 
Uh, and that's twofold. One, it's you're actually getting the number of particles as opposed to the cholesterol content, but also you're accounting for other lipoproteins apart from LDL, which yeah. are also atherogenic. Do you think most doctors sort of recognize that? And is that something that you think will start to make its way into routine blood tests? So it is recognized. Um, the various, you know, the EAS have, have recognized the importance of a direct measure of ApoB um, generally. Um, it's specifically recognized in the situations of discordance that Danny was talking about, which which seems to affect about a quarter of the population, around 25%. Okay. So it's not an Big. insubstantial number of people for whom only estimating LDL cholesterol might mischaracterize the nature of their risk. Um, but there are calls now to just in everyone have have a direct measure of ApoB as as kind of the standard. But that's not going to necessarily be something that's happening overnight mm -hmm. um, because it's kind of cheaper and easier to measure. And, and LDL cholesterol isn't necessarily directly measured when you're in primary care. It's calculated from what's known as the Friedwald equation. So, you know, yes, ApoB is more refined as a marker because it's capturing all of the every atherogenic lipoprotein in circulation, irrespective of its actual mm -hmm. subclass. But at the same time, um, there's additional, you know, cost and mm -hmm. and and um, kind of um, you know equipment and otherwise in, in implications here. So yes, it's more ideal, but it's it's not necessarily going to be something that that happens overnight. Although over time, I can imagine that there will be a a push to shift um, screening towards direct measures of ApoB. It seems, it seems to be going in that direction. What do you think about non-HDL as a marker? So if you, cause that's, that's shows up on most routine blood yeah. tests. That's pretty similar to ApoB, right? So it's, it's a, it's a good mark prior to the ApoB kind of era, mm -hmm. so to speak, if we're in that now, non-HDL was as good a marker as you could get for capturing, again, all atherogenic lipoproteins in circulation that were not HDL. So as Danny said, HDL does not contain ApoB. HDL is reverse cholesterol transport. It, can, it, it expresses another apoploprotein. Apop and so it's not involved in the processes. And it, also because of its size as well, you know, hypothetically where HDL to get into the artery, it could actually kind of get out basically. Okay. So non-HDL was providing a relatively, you know, crude but still, you know, accurate enough for prediction estimate of all other lipoproteins in circulation that were not HDL. Mm -hmm. And that would have covered LDL, it would have covered VLDL, it would have covered, you know, uh, chylomicron remnants and okay. these kind of particles. Um, and if you look at some of the analyses that we're looking, obviously, in terms of predictive um, value for these kind of measurements, then, you know, non-HDL was a very, and, and it still is in mm -hmm. certain contexts, you know, remember that this concept of discordance, while a quarter of the population is a lot of people, you know, in, in a lot, in, in a majority of individuals, it, it is still sufficient mm -hmm. to, you know, have an estimate of their LDLC mm -hmm. and non HDLC can be, right. can be, and concordance if you're using, if you're looking at, and this is, was in one of our statements from Samia Mora's research, if you look at LDL cholesterol and non HDL cholesterol, there's a lower proportion of people are discordant mm -hmm. if you're looking at those metrics together than LDLC and LDL mm -hmm. particle count. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's still a useful metric. Yeah. And I mean, one additional thing to that is when we talk about even cases where there is discordance, that's still occurring within a certain range, right? Yes. So as some of the cases we may get onto later where people have this incredibly high LDL cholesterol, like 300 plus milligrams per deciliter. You're not going to have a situation where someone's LDL cholesterol yeah. is, is that high, but like, oh, their ApoB nah. is perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. So it, it's yeah. within a certain range right. that discordance happens yes. and it doesn't, at the extremes, it's just going to become irrelevant. That's a good point. Yeah.